yesterday we did an introductory, cl introductory class on the fact that life is predictable. I would like to just do a brief summary and see how far we can go. Now, the History Makers Training is a full retreat. So what we get here is just to show us and to help us to understand what's all about and how this can impact our personal lives. The, it has seven main objectives it wants to achieve in our lives. The first is to increase a person's level of personal discipline. I'll talk about that a little bit. We've said a lot, if you're coming from the session, I believe most of us were there. How many of us were in the main session this morning? Yeah? Okay. You, you've heard a lot said, and I'm going to be speaking about that a, a lot in the sense that both in these parts that I was in the class, okay, I, a lot was said about the mission of the church, the importance of values, the actual purpose of the church, the task of the church, or what we call the purposes of the church. And you notice that all those things we said rotate around an individual's ability to lead everything. Jesus said, follow me. We said, read that yesterday. Follow me and what? I'll make you. Jesus was the one that ordained the twelve. He's the one that also said they were ready in three years. Now remember that how, how a person is able to reproduce himself depends on that person's level of preparation himself. Does that make sense? Um, okay, let me give you an example. You know, when we're in university, the, the teaching assistants took the easy courses or what were easier and the professors took the very difficult courses and very often, those difficult courses looked easier, and the easy courses looked difficult. Do you, do you get the point I'm making? You know, something that is complex, when a professor takes it, it looks simple. And then when somebody that is still kind of, you know, researching, when they take it, sometimes, you know, you're even more concerned about their grammar, the way they But the prof has gone very far. He's, he's, he has a reputation already. He's a professor. He's known all over the world. So when he comes... It's very simple. He's trying to say things in a simple way. So everything we've said, he said, I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. So history makers training is focused on developing the man himself. You becoming a leader that other people can follow. Becoming a leader that can reproduce yourself. You know, Pastor David mentioned things, the church, for example. You, 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 you can ask the question, that if the church has won millions of souls in Nigeria, how come the nation did not reflect that quality of Christianity? Why didn't you feel the impact? And the answers are many, but some of, some of, a few of them are very punchy, and that's why we're going through this, is that people do not become like what you say. They become like who you are. Okay? And... It, any spiritual person will notice this over time. Your children are not becoming like your words. They're becoming like you. They will, they will practice your habits. They will, they will imitate you. They will do like you. They will wear, dress like you, and so on and so forth. So the first objective is personal discipline. The next objective is of the history makers training is that it teaches you how to live a very focused life. A life of focus. And the way to measure this is that if you say to yourself, if you look at yourself and look at your age today, maybe you're 30 here, maybe you're 35, maybe you're 37, maybe you're 40, and you say, and you bring three 40-year-olds into this room, three people that are 40, and you look at them, their accomplishments won't be the same. And usually it's not because of IQ or EQ. It's not because of the schools they attended or did not attend. It would be how they have managed their life. Okay, and the, of course, the formative years, you're guided by a leader. And if that leader is failing, if your mother doesn't know how to manage time, of course, you're going to grow up not knowing how to manage time. 
You are going to always, when I was growing up, my mother was always looking for my certificate. Not just mine, all of us. So she was always looking for, she was very passionate, she's very devoted. People that know my mom, she's a great woman, but we're also looking for something. So I grew up always looking for something. So it's when I realized that, okay, that's not a life, okay? And then we had to start rearranging our lives in that area and also rearranging her own life in that area, okay? So teach you focus, and I might touch that again. The, the third objective of the HMT is to increase the level of your personal effectiveness. It's not just the fact that I'm a pastor, but it's also how effective am I in the work I'm called to do? How, would somebody else do your work differently if they were in your shoes? And if yes, why? What do they know that you don't know? What are the skills that they have that make that work easier? Sometimes you call it sharpening the, the, the saw. You know, you know if, the, if, the, if your, your tools are sharp, you don't use too much energy. But, you know, if they're not very sharp, you have to apply a lot of energy, okay? Um, then what the fourth objective is just work, to love work, to be a self-starter. Somebody that um, hmm, most all over the world, people that produce high-level results are known as workaholics, okay? They work extremely hard, and they have to find the balance. But on the other side, people that are not producing much results are always talking about rest. They people always give you a rest, yeah, you should rest a lot. And the thing about it is that if you look at their life, you know you shouldn't rest. Because they're advising you to rest, and you see they have nothing. So you, know, so you have to think about where you're getting the advice from. Somebody said rest. You look at him, he's 50, nothing. You know, it's not, that, you know you're not comp- it's not about materialism. It's that you're saying you're advising me to rest. What has rest produced for you? You know, so it's to love work. And this is important for us. It's the rigor of research. It's preparation. It's, you know, somebody giving, whatever you do, you do it well. But to do that, you have to love work. You have to be, you have to work when you're full of energy. You have to work when you're tired. I read something once that said that the world is ruled by tired men. And I understood it. You know, look at your, the global leaders. I mean, how do they manage their time? Did you watch Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State? How did she do it? What about Tatcha? Tatcha says she, spent, she slept for two, three hours. All those years that she was Prime Minister. I mean, she, of course, you can take a position about their political state or their position, but that's not as important as the life they lived, the impact she had. You can't wash away Tatcha's life for the rest of human history. She was a great lady. She, was, she worked hard. But it's the same thing with all great people. They spend time, but the reason is because they've come to love what they do. And we can talk about it a bit more. It teaches you how to be proactive and take initiative. To be proactive and take initiative. What does this really mean? You know, the law of action states that nothing will happen until I make it happen. I'm just going to this objective to lay a foundation to, see, to tell you why the leader must first lead himself effectively before he can lead other people. To be proactive. Every person that is result-oriented, will act on the spur of a moment. One of the things you should observe, observe leaders, wherever you are, observe Pastor David, observe leaders when you work with them, watch people's ability to make decisions. People that are effective over time learn to make decisions quickly. They can make seven decisions in ten minutes, okay? And, and the reason is not because they don't have the fear of failure, because one of the reasons people don't decide is fear of failure. If I decide to travel and the time was not right, well, there are all kinds of factors. But you have to possess yourself to realize that a leader must be in motion. You must keep on going. All those fears, you have to put them down. Okay? So you have to think on your feet as a leader. You have to think on your feet. It's, a, it's even better, superior, to make the wrong decision and correct yourself before people have made a decision. You've made it and corrected it. They are still praying about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay? So, but that's, you have to deal with that. It's very personal. You have to deal with the fear of what about if we side the church here, it didn't work. If it doesn't work, you know, you do it again. Somebody said, what, if, what about if I miss God? You know, I, over the years I learned that God is so big that if you miss him, he will find you anywhere in the world. Don't, be, don't ever be afraid of missing God. Never fear missing God. He's so massive. Any place you f- miss, he will catch you. He will, he will call you back. Does that make sense? Don't be afraid of missing God. He will catch you. He will find you. Okay, then mastery, self-mastery. That's one of the purposes, self-mastery. This is one of the symbols, proof of leadership. A person that masters themselves, you know your strength, you know your weakness. By the way, when you read biographies, all the great leaders had great weaknesses. But what made them truly great is their understanding of themselves. All the great leaders had great weaknesses. 
they had issues, but they were great because they understood, they mastered themselves. They mastered themselves. They knew when to sleep, how to handle things, and so on and so forth. And we'll touch that again. The final one is introducing God to us in a fresh way. We have enough religion in our society. I've had enough religion in my lifetime already. And religion is like when you say, by the grace of God, I'll be there. Say, how are you doing? By the grace of God, I'm doing well. Have you booked your flight? By the grace of God, I'm going to book the flight. <laughs> you know, I've had a lot of that, you know. And when we're saying that, it's what Pastor Andre is teaching. You know, we're not thinking about what we're saying. By the grace of God, you'll be there. So you came late by the grace of God. <laughs> it mean, the grace of God can make you come. You know, but when you think about the grace of God that brought salvation, can a man really be walking by grace and be late? You know, but the reason we're doing that is because that's how we grew up. People use those things. They don't know the meaning. So in, in HMT, they don't quote scriptures a lot. You've, and it's not because they don't understand the Bible. It's the fact they understand that we, we have religion, but they want to teach you God in a different way. There's a difference between applying the Bible and quoting the Bible. Okay, and the power of scripture is not in the quotation. It's in the revelation knowledge. Does that make sense? You shall know the truth. And then that truth, you know, will what? Set you free. And uh, like yesterday I said, that most of life, most of learning, maybe more than 70% of learning is in the action. You know, you can know a lot. If you don't do a lot, you won't really know a lot. Okay? So if your learning is going to transform you, you are going to be action-oriented. And of course, you know Pastor David is very action-oriented. Okay? Um, sometimes people wait, they want to understand something. I'm, sometimes I'm like that. You want to grab something. You want to really understand it. But the truth is that if you want to know how to drive, drive a car. When I was a teenager, the only teenagers that drove were the ones that had the courage to drive. All the ones that were respectful to their parents, they told them, until you turn 18, you won't drive. And they followed those rules. They didn't drive until they were 40. <laughs> because when you're, when you're 18, you're now old enough, they tell you about insurance, about accident. You just be backing off. But when you're 16, 15, you don't know about insurance. You just do, you bash people's car. You don't even know what they're talking about. Do you understand? You just drive. You, you scratch the car. Of course, most people later on in life, they will tell you this story. They will tell you that nobody taught them how to drive, but they will tell you how many cars they spoiled. So you also have to be wise. People will tell you, ah, nobody taught me. That's a dangerous person. Okay, how did you learn how to drive? You just entered the car, you drove. Of course, you. Some people even kill their people. People kill people, but they won't tell you that. They'll say, I've been driving since I was 14. So there's a place to find the balance that you need to be taught, but you must still drive. You have to enter that car. You have to. If you don't drive, you won't drive. I know many adults that don't drive, and the reason is that they are old enough to, they know too much to drive now. They don't drive. They are 50, they are 40. You know, praise the Lord. Okay, let's move forward. So these are the objectives, and, and, and yesterday I touched on it. I, I touched on what you call the greatest secret of success. People that are successful, are they successful because they are successful? People that are successful, are they successful because they are successful? What does it mean to be a successful pastor? What about football? You love football? What about the great soccer players? Who won the last World Cup? Do you remember? And the one before, uh huh? The, Germany. Then who won before Spain, right? Now, did you notice that if you follow football, that the year Spain won, won, won the World Cup, they were the most organized team. They were the team that plays like. In fact, in the Spanish team, nobody could reign like a star. They were they had great players, but it was a team. Now, four years later, it was Germany that had a team. So the people that win the World Cup is the nation that comes with a team. We win the World Cup. The nation that comes with a Messi. We're not winning World Cup. A Messi cannot win a World Cup. The World Cup is too tedious for a star to win it. In fact, if you get to the finals and you're Messi, they'll just take one risk and they break your leg. They just, it's a risk. The person will get a red card, but you two will go out. You all go together. But that, they, because they know it's not a team. Because the whole strategy is built on one man. And built on one man is not a good strategy. Because they can cut him off. But if it's a team, whoever you touch can go. Somebody will replace him. The team is still intact. Right? So, but, so the question I'm asking is that, what is the great secret of success? What, what, when, whether in soccer, in life, in pastoring, what is the great secret? Well, what we learn, and what Pastor Sunday taught us is this, very simple. That the greatest secret of success is that life is what? Predictable. That when you watch greatness, you can predict greatness by, great, by the daily routine of greatness. 
Okay, in every field of human endeavor, there are principles that come into play. And once those principles are understood and applied, that success is guaranteed. And this is important. Let me explain this again. There are many pastors in the room. Don't be mesmerized by success. I've been there. Okay? You see, the first time I went to Ukraine, I, I was caught off guard because I had never met a man like Pastor Sunday because maybe I've never been that close. I've met many successful people, yes. But to work with him that closely, with humanity, his simplicity, his humility, and all that. So the first thing that will capture you is a wow. What a great man. Okay? And many people never recover from that. I have people that come to Ukraine, they don't recover from that. They just sit down with Pastor Sunday and they tell him how great he is. I removed my, from myself from the club years ago. I don't talk nonsense. That's nonsense. Does that make sense to you? Because the truth is that that's not what the leader wants. Those are the people that destroy a leader. Because the leader is a leader because of the price he has paid. Does that make sense? Think about it for a moment. Because of what he's doing. But Sunday used to say that people will see him, he looks slim. He said, but when I remove my shirt, I see myself. I'm not that slim. So that's what it means by transparency. The leader knows a lot of things. Okay? But what makes him great? What made him a great pastor? It was not a wish. It was not a gift. It was a process, a prize, character development, daily routines that became habitual until he became like a moving locomotive that cannot be stopped. But it's, it's that small, small things. Daily routine, I get up, I have, my life is systematic, I go to work, I do my research, I read, I pray. It looks small. But if you do those small things over many years, it's not the same anymore. It's not the same. Let, let, let's take, let, let me give an example. Okay, let's take an Obama and a Michelle. I'm not a, I'm not a fan of their philosophies about life. Right? I don't believe in the things they believe. I don't understand them. But I'm amazed at how they look, at how they got to the White House. They didn't start practicing self-discipline at the White House. They are very disciplined people. When you see them, you can see. You can see that these people were destined for greatness in quote. They paid the price. You know, the way they look, they went to school, good schools, they got married, you know, the, you know, the lifestyle. And it's those daily routines that makes a leader truly great. Those philosophies about themselves. Of course, a leader can make many choices throughout their life. So that life is predictable. It's very simple. That life on earth are governed by fixed laws. And that life on earth are therefore lived by these laws. Miracles are the exception, not the rule. We don't live by miracles. What this means is that there are no failures in life. That if God calls me to pastor and I'm not doing well, the territory is not difficult. Pastor Andre said that yesterday. Every great pastor will tell you the same. They will tell you that there's no problem with territories. There's only problem with men. Because if you faint in the day of adversity, what? Your strength is small. But notice the statement. I said that last year and I said it again. No, in that statement, what was measured? Eh? But adversity is not measured. Because a man can grow in strength. Adversity does not grow in adversity. Does that make sense? It's like, it's like paying rent. If you come to a city, you pay rent, right? The rent doesn't change much. I've been paying almost the same rent for four, five years. Change a little bit in life. I've been li living in the same house for 10 years. But a man can change much. A man can change much. About 1992, for example, we are trying to rent a place, the family. And the woman said we should bring five-year rent. So when we discussed, my brother said, how can you commit to live in a place for five years? It doesn't mean that you don't plan to grow. I mean, two years is okay, three years. But five years means that you're condemning yourself to that environment. He said, no. He said, no, you can't do that. And it sounded to be prophetic. Because that rent will not be growing, but you can grow. If a man faints in the day of adversity, his strength... If you fail, you jump. It's not jump. Jump doesn't change your question. I hope you know jump has a bank of questions. The professors don't make new questions. It's not that easy to create new questions. A new questions, it's not that easy. You can adjust it. You can change four to five. But you can't just sit down and be creating new questions. But you can become smarter than jump if you study. You can, you can increase your skills. And that's how life is. 
Life looks dif difficult when you're ignorant. When you don't know, it looks difficult. But the truth is that if you keep acquiring the skills by studying the laws, and you study laws by studying those that leave those laws, it doesn't mean that you just go to a lab and make, you don't make up the laws, by the way. The way to go up a mountain is to follow the man that has gone up the mountain back and forth many, many times. If you follow him, you go up the mountain. Does that make sense? Yes. And you don't need to reinvent the wheels. You have to kill the ego. You have to fight yourself. It's a problem. Because there's something in us that wants to say, but I, I discovered this scripture, this revelation. You know, it, it, it's as if it makes you feel very good. But don't let that deceive you. You can write the same book you have read with the same title. The only difference is that the new one has your name and it's different. No, you have to understand. I'm serious. You write, time is life. Personally wrote one. When you read it, if it changes you and has done something in you and you have produced result, you can have the same title. Just, just, you can do it to kill your own ego. So they say, ah, you copy the book, they'll be killing you, so you die. Do you understand? But you're doing that because you want to free yourself from ego. You don't want to feel, I have to discover. When somebody's preaching, no, no, no. Let me go. No, you don't need to. Listen, buy the books. Read with an open mind. Humble yourself. Because eventually, when the truth has entered you, it will come out a different way completely. Because of your uniqueness of creation. You're different. But you must receive the truth in humility. So, studying laws doesn't mean that you crack your brain it means that the, tape, the message you heard that it's changing you, buy the message. Pastor David was talking about retreat, personal retreat. You have to settle it in this room. If you don't settle it before you leave this conference, 2015 may look the same like 2014. How many times a year will you go on personal retreat? Put it on your calendar. That's the law of life too. If you don't calendarize it, it will not happen. Let me tell you why. Because what will make you not go will be so strong. It may be a call from your apostle, from the apostle of Dominion City. I need you. But you see, if you share your calendar with him, I'm giving you a secret. He, he might not stop him from calling you, but he'll give him, he'll say, but actually he told me, so he might consider it. But if you're just there, and you just, you don't have a calendar, you don't, you don't, you don't you just say, we'll go on retreat, we'll go on retreat, somebody will be dying in church. You have to go and pray for them. There'll be baby dedication, there'll be weddings, there'll be stuff going on. Those things will always happen. But the law of life teaches that when you plan ahead, and put it in a calendar. It locks you up. When somebody calls you, you say, can I check my calendar? You check. I would like to come, but there's a conflict. This is a conflict. What do I do? But you see, all effective people act like this. I didn't know why people acted like this. When I first went to America, they used to give us annual calendars. I was shocked. Ah, they'll give you a calendar from January to December. Now, in Nigeria, they did the same, but they never taught us strategic calendaring. I never understood the concept. You know, when you go to school, even primary school, they have an annual calendar, you know. But nobody ever highlighted that. So I didn't understand it. I didn't know the importance of putting those things there. And by the way, it's a skill that a man acquires. You have to acquire the skill. You get used to thinking ahead, thinking about it, and say, okay, so I'm now focused on personal retreat. Why am I saying this? Because all I'm sharing this morning will be relevant except you spend time with it. Because the Bible says that the word dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten son of God. But the Bible says that the word was made flesh. It was made flesh. It was made flesh. It was made flesh. The word doesn't become flesh except a man pays that price in constant meditation. Thinking time. Thinking. Thinking. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein when? Day and night. Day and night. Day and night. It's good to listen to many tapes and you have to keep on. But just remember that don't be ashamed of repeating the message. Just play over and over and over again. Many of us practice this, but these are important principles. Because what is going on is that you are applying a law. You are being changed inside out. Okay? So the greatest secret of success is that human existence is governed by fixed laws. There is a law of conferencing. See, you remember people do conferences all over the world. It's not only Christians that do conferences. All over the world. And the laws that govern it is the same. You have to make sure your venue is ready. There are, are facility managers. There are logistics people. You have to make sure if there's food, all those kind of things. It's simple laws. Airlines, they fly all over the world. When you start an airline business in Nigeria, 
you just go and get the existing manual and apply it in total. You can't make new ones. Have you wondered how pilots are able to fly? The last time I came, I was coming from abroad. Okay, I had to go from Boston, Logan, to Detroit. And the time interval was less than one hour. And I asked them, will my luggage make it? They said to me that Delta needs only 20 minutes to move luggage from one plane to the other. Why? They are trained. They are applying a law. And this thing is manual. Oh. There's no machine for moving luggage. So. Yes, there's machine for collecting. But that movement is done by human beings. Does that make sense? Okay. And they do that routinely, daily. It's a system. And some airports have thousands of flights or hundreds of flights. But they are all a system. They are applying certain laws. Okay. Queuing theory. Those planes must not hit each other in the air. They have a control system. The control tower, like we're going to hear about systems. Our lives will become more effective when it starts to run like that. Okay? We succeed in life when we discover these principles and apply them. Let's take pastoring, because I'm going to go into time management very soon, which is very important, which is the main meet for me. What makes a pastor effective? I want to ask you. If I bring seven pastors to this room now, what will be the difference? In results, what would be the difference? Not doctrine, just results. Why is a pastor able to produce himself and plant churches and the other one struggle? Is it because the callings were different, a different Jesus? It's not a different Jesus. It's about knowledge and how much that knowledge has changed that person. When we were younger, we took lessons for common entrance. In fact, when we were in primary school, the people that used to confess, when I went to, I went to a mission school, usually the, the daughters and sons and teachers used to do confess a lot. But when we went to secondary school, they stopped coming first. So we found out why. They were doing lessons at home. Repetition, lessons. But when they left their parents, all of us, everybody was playing soccer, playing everything, and they stopped doing the lesson, they stopped passing too. Why? Because if you study, you're going to pass. It's a law of life, right? If you study, you're going to pass. I said it yesterday that people don't make a first class because they're intelligent. They may grasp the concept because they're intelligent, but if you're going to make a first class, it's, thank you very much. It's because you are following the teacher, you're consistent, continuous assessment, and so on and so forth. So if you, if you bring several pastors, what would be the big difference? There is the anointing, but that's out of our control. You pay the price, you pray. But there are many people, Jehovah's Witness, are they more anointed than Pentecostals? They're not. What about the Mormons? Do they have more spirit than us? I don't think so. But they're very organized, structure. They're extremely organized. There's a bank that was built in Lagos some years ago. Some of you use the GT Bank. And the people that founded it told us, shared a testimony of how they built the bank. They said for the first five years, they worked so hard like madmen. I met a man that mentored them who said they came to him and said, we want to learn to train. He said that when he was done, they were almost training better than him. They imbibe a lot of things. What's there? It's the law of building. They apply the same laws to build institutions. The law of structure, thinking structures, thinking the future, they had a goal, they set it. Why is this important? Because I don't want us to think that because we are Christians, that if a branch runs an airline and follows certain principles and not know the principle, that that airline will fail no, but, but the principal is committed to the principles. It's just that he will never make it to heaven for being a rich, a, rich, a, a rich man. He has to know the principal to make it to heaven. But on this earth, that business will run by principles, not by prayer. Am I communicating? Yes. That's why he can start businesses. That's why all these people, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, that we don't know so much about their persuasion, about their faith, but they run global organizations. They are working the laws of God. They are, those laws they are working is that they are systematic in their thinking, which will be a different subject. But they are working those laws. They are proving that life is predictable. They are proving that life is predictable. So let's go on from here. So, in other words, all I've said today is that from those objectives, you can see that a lot of the focus is on the man. If I'm going to, if the primary calling of a church is to produce men, righteous men, the man that is the producer must what, be what? 
righteous. And they were saying that there is a gift of righteousness, the fruit of the spirit, but that even that itself is developed by a man spending time. So what does this mean? What it means is that when Jesus launched his ministry, he first spent time to become. And then he recruited men and made them like him. And then when he transferred those three important things, remember what we learned this morning? What did he transfer to them? Three things. One, his life. Number two. Number three. When that was done, the spirit was still hanging. But when the other two was completed and they were ready for the spirit, he said, my work is finished. My work was done. So, what this implies, we learned yesterday, is that if you are called to a city to lead a church, the first thing is not to rent a building where you meet. That would be a mistake. It means that you're going to start owing money before you have money. The first thing is to be like Jesus, raise men. Raise men. But to raise men, you have to be raised. So, in this, in, at HMT, we focus on raising the man that can raise other men. The raising of this man. In other words, I'm saying that the men we admire and respect became who they are by hard work, by diligence, by following the process, by following the laws of life. And some of those things they did is what we're taking here. Okay, so today, I want to focus on the time management system of Benjamin Franklin just to teach us that in everything I've said so far, that... <clears throat> A person's ability to manage their life is the key to them reaching the end result. To manage your life. But managing your life is what? It's really managing your time. Because remember that time is life. We've already established that and we can reestablish that again. Time is life simply because to create life on earth, God had to step out of eternity and create time so that he could create man in time. And because he created time on earth to create life, time is life. And time is only a pause in eternity. Just a segment. It has a beginning, has an end. And that time will come and roll away, and eternity will continue. Eternity is a dimension of God. It's not like a time dimension. Just, just God lives in eternity. Just like, but he stepped out of that. So managing time is managing your life. And what you make out of your life is what you made out of your time. So to make something from life, I must make something from time. But time, we learn, is not measured in years. It's not like saying that in 2015, when you say that, if you don't break it down, not much will happen. When you say in 2015, I will, I will, the year will just be passing by. Today is what, 20 what? 28. 28, that's four weeks already in the new year. So to manage time is to manage seconds, not hours, not days. Okay? So that's why Moses said, teach us what? Teach us what? That we may what? Teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. What does it mean to number your days? It means to give account of every day. Teach us. So if I say to you, what did you do yesterday? You have to be able to say that. If you can't say that, it's gone. What did you do yesterday? What about the day before? What about last week? What did you do? So a person must be able to stop at the end of every day and think how he spent that day. At the end of every week and give account of that week. And what you do with your week, some of it is what we'll be dealing with tomorrow. Because when you go through your week, you have to say, what did I do wrong? What's my plan to be better off next time? For example, if you were married and you say, ah, I'm not managing my home well. Maybe the way I spoke to my spouse. It's wanted to say that once, twice, but if that's habitual, you just say in, in, this, in the eastern part of Nigeria, that's how men talk. Uh, that's a problem. That means you're not going to become the value that can be multiplied by God. You can't, you can't put culture with God. The word of God. You have to live a tranquil life. Stress-free life. If you have problems at home, your life will be full of stress. You must not have problem at home. You have to know that you, you are not allowed to because your life will be stressful. But to have a stress-free life at home, the most important thing you have to manage is your words. Because until you speak stressful words, you can't have stress. If your words are peaceful, your atmosphere will be peaceful. If your words are calm, your whole life will be calm. So if the devil wants to trouble you, he will just make you angry, and you speak angry words. 
God will forgive you, but that atmosphere has changed. You have to fight with your whole life to bring calmness. Does that make sense? So if you speak angry words, you always be pouring fuel in your own home. It'll be, what do you call it? Is it um, what's that word? Volatile. Volatile. You, you don't want that. Because remember that it's to finish your destiny, which needs an atmosphere of creativity. You need time to think. You need time to plan. And the place you're supposed to do this thing is your home. Okay? So, bear those things in mind. Benjamin Franklin told us a time, he, taught, he developed a system of time management that enabled him to accomplish much more than his own contemporaries. He turned it into a system. It wasn't just like something he discovered. He developed it as a system. And what he did was basically life management. How do you make the most of your life? And I've said it before, and I want to say it again, that when people, when you know where you're going, you walk briskly. Except when you're really, really exhausted. But when you're not sure where you're going, you don't know that your, your vision and goal orientation is in your steps. If you watch a man that doesn't know where he's going, you watch the way he'll be walking. He walks like a man that doesn't know where he's going. Because he really doesn't know where he's going. But a man that knows where he's going, he's always trying to catch up with time. Okay? They will take time because if you're in a hurry, you can't walk with dignity. So, also, as you mature, you don't see the president in a hurry. And just they're in a hurry. Because they also thought to work with dignity. You are the president. Don't be in a hurry. The whole world, the world is waiting for you. Take it easy. They wait for you. The play will wait for you. It's Air Force One. Don't worry. It's not a commercial play. Don't worry. Take it easy. You understand? So, he's always working like this. But his insights are racing. There are issues burning. Okay? But it's about life management. It's about managing your life. What would 2015 look like for you? You know, it looks like as if it's abstract. But the part that is abstract, the part that is out of our control, they are small. It's not everything you don't know. If you're a pastor, you have a pastor over you who has set some goals for you, that's not abstract anymore. Does that make sense? You are going somewhere. There are certain things. There are mission conferences. This conference, do you know when I knew the date? Ah, since last year. It's not abstract. It must have been on your calendar before my calendar. Think about it for a moment. So there's so much we don't know, but there are some things we know. We have to build our life on the things we don't, with things we know, and give the things we don't know over to God in faith that God will take care of it, as we seek His face. Does that make sense? So that's what. We, so when we, so because somebody can say, but how can a man look into the future when I'm, you're not God? I know that, but don't forget that the basis of this training is that we are created in the image of God. We have God qualities in us, even if it's small g, and that should be settled. A dominion mandate, a dominion assignment, right? We are co-creators with God. We are trying to manage our life in partnership with God, not leave it to not fatalism, thinking anything can happen. Ah, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen. Ah, this election, this election, we don't know who will win. How much time? Fifteen. Fine. We say we don't know. Yes, that's fine. There may be things we don't know. Okay? But you, you build on the things you know. So the first thing Benjamin Franklin did was that he developed a time management system that was built on first taking time to look at the end of your life and walking backwards. That is superior to a New Year resolution it's superior to just having a daily plan or a monthly plan or an annual plan. He looked what you call your global life vision. Where would you like to be at the end of your life? And because we are Christians, that's a question we can ask from God. Where is my life going? But remember this, that there are questions that God will not answer in a hurry. Nobody goes to God now and says, where am I going? God will answer you immediately. No. He knows you are not big enough to understand it. He'll walk you through a process, but he will answer you. And if you persist in answering, there'll be a clarity come to you that is out of this world. You don't know everything, but you know enough. So it's built on global life vision. It means that, that for me to think about today, I must think about, but where am I going? But Benjamin Franklin then said something else. It is something else. He says that I may not know exactly where I'm going. I may not know what God has called me to do, but that if I can discover my values, the things that are most important to me, it will help me define who I am. Okay? 
It will help me define who I am. And let me explain this because this is scriptural. You see, if you are called into the pastoral ministry, one of the ways to understand your calling is to understand the pastors whose lives affect you the most. Okay, because there is something in you crying out for the thing in them. Okay? So, and what he said, you're defining your values. Oh, I like this. Why do you like him? He's a church planter. Oh, why do you like him? He's very humble. Why do you like him? I like the way he communicates the word. Why do you like him? I like the way he carries himself. You're defining the things that are important to you. And those things are called your values. Of course, the superior value is the value of Christ. So, the Benjamin Franklin model is built on the concept of global life vision, which is based on a person's value system. On the ground is that. That your life is built on those things that are most important to you. Taking a long-term view. And that will make a world of difference. Because the moment a person can see, the way you walk will be different. The moment you can see, everything will be different. Because sight would add discipline to you. And by the way, discipline is not... Nobody has discipline. Or nobody is disciplined. What is discipline is a practice of a habit. You see, if I wake up every day by 6, because I go to work by 8, okay, they will say he's disciplined. If I start waking up by 7.30, I'll be late. So, it's a habit. But what psychology has shown us is that because we are creatures of habit, that to change your disciplines, you don't need to struggle with that. Just change your habits. Okay? Because, you see, when you go to a restaurant, you sit in the same place. Because it's human nature. You like to sit there all the time. But sit in a different place. Do things differently. Okay? So, when you say discipline, what it really means is to form new habits. To look to where you're going and say, what do I need to do now that will get me there? Okay? So, it has global life values. And then, on, that, on those values, you now build your life purpose. What it means is that because those values determine to me what's important to me, I can use it to determine how far, what God is calling me to do. If you were a pastor, you can say, in the next 50 years, where will I be? In the next 40 years. Some of it you may not understand, but by looking that far, by asking questions, you're clarifying your future. And it makes a world of difference. On, on your global purpose in life, you build your, what you might call your goals. You start to set goals. This is just a model of Benjamin Franklin. He took time to prepare this. Because what he did was, this one made him to be ahead of his time. Because by thinking in this way, first of all, what I'm sharing is, a, is rigorous. Because one of the things that most people find the most difficult is to sit down and think. It's harder than praying sometimes. The reason is that because you can pray without thinking. But you can't think without thinking. Okay, so I want you to understand uh, for me, it's hard work. It will wear you out sometimes. You know, to sit down and start thinking through the year. I say, God, I, I've invited you to this room. You see, it's easier for me to say, Lord, I commit 2015 to your hands. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. And I can pray, 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 pray. Okay, but if I say to God, I have called you. I know you are in this room. I want to plan the year. Help me. What are my milestones this year? You're alone. He's tired, man. He's tedious. You want to get up. You put on the TV. Put it off. Okay, if you, if you went on a, to a hotel, you're the only one in the room. After a while, once, look, I've heard, I've heard. I believe that God has spoken. Let's go, let's go. It's, that's, but you have to sit there and think. And if you're an apostolic leader, you might need to go with a team. I think best with people. Because sometimes you feel so much and you don't know how to articulate it. But when people start talking to you, it can come out. Okay? It can come out of you. So you sit down and you set those goals. What is the whole essence of this process? The Benjamin Franklin time management system wants to take you to bring you from your long-term plan to mid-term to your annual plan to your monthly plan to your daily plan where the things you do every day, there is such a clarity that you can identify your assignments. Let me explain that because of time. Since my time is limited. You see... I spoke about focus. Many people's lives are reactionary. You can get a call now, come to better, and you start going. 
I live in Lagos. You can be in VI. Somebody will call you and say, let's meet in Festac. If you don't understand life, you can actually start driving to Festac. But when you get a call, let's meet in Festac, the first question is that, what are we meeting over? Can, it, can we discuss on the phone? No, it's something that needs face-to-face -face meeting. Then remember that if you go to Lakey, from Lakey to Festac, your meeting may last one hour, but the trip may last seven hours. So the actual time is eight hours. Did you think about that? Does that make sense? So you, so you can't drive for seven hours, six hours for a one-hour meeting, except that one-hour meeting is truly important. But what makes it important? It's how it fits into God's plan for your life and the assignment. But what is the assignment? The real assignment is that are you spending enough time to become those values that you want to pass on to other people? Summons. Thank you very much. Summons are a product of a person's life. Sermons are a product. It's important to preach. There are many doctrines and things to teach. But the most important thing is your life. It's who you are becoming and who you become. If a person spends the time to become, the forcefulness of the message will be stronger. And becoming has many components. It means your manner of life, your manner of speech, how much you're controlled, um, your ability to, to think far, to act in the moment, to be in charge. The way to define values is say, if everybody lived like me, what would the world look like? When you're leading people, which is what he was trying to do, because for us as Christians, ultimately, since we understand our assignment, is to produce men that can be in every facet of society. When you're leading people, it means that the hardest work you're going to do is working on yourself. So the whole essence of time management is to create enough time that you're actually doing that work on yourself. You're spending that time to become those things, to assimilate those values, to become the example other people can follow. And it's not achieved in a hurry. For Benjamin Franklin, I'll teach on this tomorrow. Because there are 52 weeks, he took one aspect of life, did it for 13 weeks, and repeated it four times a year. Four times, that is 50. So it means that in a year, he might just be working on one thing, just humility or temperance or self-control. The challenge we have is that we live in a very fast-paced generation, and prayers not answered now, we think they're not answered. But I expect that my own child will be an extension of my life on earth. It makes a world of difference. It changes the way I think. Think about that. What are your values? What is your legacy? For Jesus Christ, all he left were those 11 men. Forget about Judas for a moment. 11 men. No buildings. No structures. He left them, but he left them as a system. He invested his life in them with a lot of wisdom. He spent time in prayer. He saw the end that he was called the savior of the whole world. I thought if you're called to change the world, you have a crusade all over the world. That's what I would do logically. If I'm going to change the world, I travel the world and I change the world. But Jesus did not leave the Palestine of his day. He invested himself in those men. That's what we mean by time management system. He understood his time. Jesus was in a hurry many times. He went through, th there were cities he went. They wanted him to preach. And he said, I have to go to other places because I have to invest that time. So what are you going to do with your time? How are you going to organize your time? I will close with this. I went to the bookstores. Okay. And they said they don't have, but I know they have this in the bookstore, the Minnesota City bookstores in Lagos, right? Because we'll be talking about some of this. For a class like this, you have to get materials. So um, Pastor David, they don't have it in the bookstore here. So they said they'll get it. You need to get this and then take what I've shared. Go back home and begin to investigate it. Say to yourself, where am I now? What's the gap in my life? What areas do I struggle? What do I do about that? And you use your time wisely. And that wise investment of time is when you are building into yourself those important values and you're transforming. People will not know the difference. But when that is mixed with God, the rest will be history. It will be, it will be phenomenal results that will outlive you. Thank you.